Did Weinstock or Simpson bankrupt GEC? An unparalleled insider view of the downfall of the largest manufacturer in the UK. Ted Slevin MSC BTEC Microface Limited July 2017. At one time, the UK GEC company was the third largest company on the UK stock exchange behind Shell and BP. As with so many UK companies, the demise was quite swift and it was eventually broken up by other companies after effectively being bankrupted. There is always speculation as to why this happens to UK companies but in the case of GEC it is firmly attributed in the business world, and the press, as being due to disastrous acquisitions by the CEO Simpson after years of careful management by Lord Weinstock. In fact, it actually says in Wikipedia about Weinstock, he was noted for holding his counsel during the disastrous dismantling and subsequent collapse of GEC, renamed Marconi PLC, under his successors. I was on the inside of the GEC demise several times during my career early on as an employee and later as a supplier of high-tech designs. This gives me a rare insight into the workings of the company which sheds a completely different light on the GEC demise to the point where the company was so fundamentally lacking in any advanced technology obviously required to run a high-tech electronics manufacturer when Simpson took over that Simpson had to go out on an urgent acquisition spree to bolster up the technology and obviously high-tech companies saw him coming. Weinstock took over as MD of GEC in 1963 and I joined a rival company Marconi in 1964 after he had just started the expansion of GEC. During my time with Marconi I worked on the design of radio equipment. I would say that it did push hard on every aspect of radio design, handling well the changeover to integrated circuits from discrete transistors. I worked on the Myriad computer which was developed in collaboration with Ferranti, who produced the integrated circuits. Its small size meant it was the only solution for some markets such as priceless portable radar systems. However, in 1967-8, GEC supposedly merged with Marconi. This was marketed as a merging of equals but, as usual, ended up being run by Weinstock. When this happened the movement of staff between GEC and Marconi became an internal transfer and when my apprenticeship ended I could choose where to go. I chose GEC and Coventry as they had already absorbed others and were at the forefront or so I thought of computerized telephone exchanges. I considered this a major growth area. Within a couple of weeks, I realized that the department was completely lacking in investment and was trying to sell mediocre designs and pay for improvements in the technology on the back of new orders. So, I did some digging around and found that the GEC mobile radio division in Spawn Street in Coventry and with my experience from Marconi put me in a perfect position to move there on week three. I was disappointed that the instruments I was expected to work with were not a patch on the ones I had access to at Marconi, but I easily circumvented this deficiency by requisitioning instruments from the Marconi division in Chelmsford. One particular instrument I liked was a time domain reflectometer, when I had it delivered I suddenly found myself surrounded by GEC staff who had been so starved of instruments that they had never seen such a device. This was a booming field of development as it was obvious that the effect of the integrated circuits on radio would be profound. Another weakness was we had to use dial-up bureaus for computer design with no complex number arithmetic so important for radio design whereas at Marconi it was the same as I was used to at college of an in-house computer programmed in the perfect mathematical language Fortran with complex variables freely usable in formulas. Incidentally native complex number variables did not appear in the more modern languages for another 30 years. However, someone in the management chain, Mr. Driver appreciated that the environment for designing radios was much better at Marconi and Chelmsford than at GEC and a move to three bays, Badder Road, Chelmsford was enacted. This renamed our division to Marconi Mobile Radio Division and we designed radios for the police and other authorities. I was seriously pleased with the move back to Marconi as I had already had enough of the poor investment attitude of GEC. However, it was not long before the management style of Weinstock was about to shatter my illusions as it had gradually engulfed Marconi in my two-year absence. I was an avid leader of the semiconductor press and was buying integrated circuits from Texas Instruments, Fairchild, and Motorola. I was a very keen watcher of Fairchild as it was quite obvious that they were leading the field on semiconductor integration at the time. 
I immediately knew in 1969 that some of the brightest people from Fairchild had set up Intel so I kept a close eye on Intel. When they introduced the 256-bit, part number 1101, memory as their first RW memory product, I immediately saw the potential for semiconductor memory and raised an immediate order for 10 devices to build an 8-bits wide stored program memory. The project I was working on was a radio telephone exchange not unlike the product I was not allowed to invest in at my first GEC encounter. I was surprised to be called up in front of the chief buyer of Marconi at the New Street site, into his oak lined office which was manned by a lady more beautiful than the lady on the very tasteful calendar on the wall. A situation I have never equaled to this day. Eventually I was called into his office and confronted with the order I had raised and told that Intel was not an approved supplier and therefore I could not have my parts. This was part of a new policy to keep suppliers to a minimum supposedly to stop inferior products entering Marconi's products, but in fact, was a cost-cutting measure reducing administration and allowing bulk purchase deals. When I pointed out that Intel was the only supplier in the world to achieve 256-bit memory on one chip I was told to go to an approved supplier and tell them what I wanted. I was told anybody can make the parts if you tell them what you want. There was a complete brick wall on the situation which left me not being able to pursue the latest development path. In the end, I colluded with Walmart Electronics, later renamed Rapid Recall, for them to supply the parts marked up as crystals which they could easily be mistaken for, so I could get the right parts. Interesting enough when Walmart tried to order the parts from Intel they had a minimum order of 100 parts. Walmart was told they could buy small quantities from the trade counter at Intel. Being in Silicon Valley this was considered unusual but not a problem. When he arrived at Intel at about midday he was confronted with a long queue of young people, exclusively men, all clamoring for a few Intel parts. He was the only person in a suit. After a long wait gainfully used by talking to the kids about what all the hysteria was about, he got to the front of the queue and got his 10 parts. A rather observant fellow behind the counter who I would love to know who he was, asked why he had an English accent and was so well dressed. He said he worked for an English company who were agents for a number of US manufacturers. That's interesting, was the reply. We were just thinking we need to start selling in Europe, would Walmart like the franchise? When the parts were air freight to the UK they were brought to me personally at GEC and I was wined and dined by Walmart. During lunch, the potential of the Intel products was discussed and the story of how they obtained the parts was narrated. I was asked whether it would be a good idea for Walmart to take up this Intel franchise. Of course I said and they duly went ahead and had exclusivity in Europe for over 30 years as a result. During this time, I was head of VHF product development. Mike Pinches was head of UHF development. Our boss was Barry Scott and the whole department was led by 5 o'clock cot. He was called 5 o'clock cot because the rest of us would work well into the evening but Mr. Cot would stand by his coat at 5 o'clock and pick it up and walk straight out of 5 prompt every day. We were to find out later that Mr. Cott had approached his bosses at Marconi with the idea of a synthesized radio instead of having a hand-lapped crystal for every frequency you want to transmit and receive on. And after being told he had to get an order first he decided to design the radio at home with a few friends from Marconi. He made this decision because he considered that even with a good team in place it would take too long to develop the technology for any customer to wait for delivery. In fact, looking back we were a very young team as only the younger members had moved from Coventry to Chelmsford during the amalgamation. I remember quite clearly that on some evenings a wife or girlfriend would turn up and would be sent out for sandwiches and drinks. I even taught my wife how to set the environmental chamber to heat up the buys on cold evenings. One night she set it up and did not check that there was anything in the oven to start with. When the pies came out my boss's other project of a new mobile radio of which the first one had been made, which made it about priceless, was completely melted by the temperature required for the pies. There was no lack of skill or enthusiasm for the design teams and although we were young the technology was so new, this helped rather than hindered technological innovation. I did not fully understand the limitations of what we were doing until I gave a paper in 1971 on telephone dialing over radio. 
Proceedings of the Conference on Radio Receivers and Associated Systems, Tuesday 4th to Thursday 6th of July 1972, University College of Swansea, South Wales. Although it had its advantages at Marconi that we had still got limitless availability of test equipment of every modern type to aid us in the development. It was quite obvious we were considered incapable of making decisions as to what parts we could use and more important there were no development funds as such we had to fill orders for equipment by exaggerating what we could do and finishing off the development on the back of an order. Initially, when I joined the team, Marconi could say just about what it liked as to our existing technology and customers would readily place orders and expect us to deliver because of our name. By 1971 things had changed. Securicore would not purchase for their whole fleet if they could not get a full demonstration of the kit beforehand. In fact, I had designed a complete dial-in dial-out telephone system for cars which we exhibited at the 1971 show on the back of a couple of orders for utility companies. Consequently, at Swansea, two companies ever ready slash burned debt and multi-tone approached me with offers to fund development from a levy on all sales making R&D an overhead rather than a revenue item. It was obvious that this approach was more suitable to an emerging technology than relying on orders. The reason for this is that you had to guess what was possible and get into lots of trouble over an order if you overestimated. You therefore could not make the radical changes necessary. I could see the limitations of GEC's attitude so I jumped ship in 1971. I chose Burndept because of the better equipped laboratory, a key factor for product development. It even had its own time domain reflectometer. I kept in touch with my old boss Barry Scott at Marconi or might I say he kept in touch with me. I was never sure why he made such a fuss of me whether it was because he wanted me back. Anyway. He rose quite quickly beyond Cot to be a hitman for Arnold Weinstock. It became a time when GEC was finding that they could no longer support thousands of workers manually assembling everything from radar to telephones and they were not innovating fast enough to find other things to do. There was a whole factory assembling analog multimeters in Salford but the digital meter was taking over with just one circuit board. Discussions with Barry and his attitude showed an interesting insight to the working of the company under Weinstock. The major decision required by all high-tech companies by the management was totally avoided because investment was zero. All investment had to come from the sales in any one year. It was not even a year it turned out in the end to be 11 months but I was not to find this out for another 10 years. While HP was investing 12% of its turnover in R&D with a longer than one year view. The company I was with, Burndept Ever Ready, was 15%. GEC had a figure of zero. In any one year this looked great to the bankers. There was an immediate 15% higher profit reported by GEC than its rivals. The cash mountain grew. A major factor in the growth was the number of cost plus contracts which Marconi defense systems had such as the computers for Nimrod AU3. I got my first insight to cost plus contracts from working on the contract for the Trident submarines. There was no interest by the technical staff in the money side of the cost from the Ministry of Defense and no understanding of the technical side from the accounts and amazingly, they never spoke to each other. We used to get reprimanded for not spending enough money on these contracts even on expenses to take the engineers out to lunch. Marconi had 30 years of this, I only had one. So again, the cash mountain grew. When a department within GEC Marconi could not deliver profitability with no investment it was removed from the equation immediately. There was no consideration as to if an investment would revive it. Weinstock considered that the staff and team members had been given their chance and failed and they were obviously highly skilled staff so why should he be pouring more money into help? On one occasion when it was decided that for example a division making analog power meters could no longer turn a profit Barry was sent by Weinstock to close it down. He boldly walked in as he had done to many other sites and told the bosses of the closure and told them to inform their staff. One department head was so distraught by the sudden news that he went into the toilets and hung himself rather than tell his staff. Barry was greeted next morning by the whole company surrounding him beating sticks on buckets and chanting murderer. He obviously took this very seriously, especially as it was then quite obvious that he could not continue working at the same job. 
I am not sure if Barry left GEC to run a high-tech staff recruiting agency engineering management selection in collaboration with Weinstock or by himself. However, he spent the next few years recruiting high-tech engineers to put into failing GEC groups supposedly to sort them out. Again, no money and only new staff to be paid for by redundancies of others or improved sales. The next time I came across Barry was when he found a couple of engineers to put into Marconi's nuclear development division. The nuclear industry in the early 80s was winding down and a whole department supporting this industry was about to go. It was decided that in this case there were genuine market forces at play and if the division could diversify it may be able to adapt and improve. Again, GEC did not put any money in, only a new staff injection. Barry found Terry Biedman and others to join this GEC nuclear division. They decided they were going to diversify into manufacturing test rigs and wind farms. By then I was running a company providing the computer systems for test rigs and the software, Microface Limited. GEC approached me with the idea that they would fit our computers to their test rigs to give them a quick stake into the market. Microface had just spent three years developing software for test rig automation and it was quite apparent that GEC could not replicate this on the back of a 30-week delivery test cell. This was a common way of getting around the no new development rule by finding a small company you could influence to make up the shortfall. So, when Simpson did this later it was not new. I had just finished automating test rigs for Ferodo, testing brakes and Leyland trucks, testing engines. I contacted these customers to be told that they were looking for a company like GEC to make complete test rigs. One for T and N Corston House Rugby and 24 engine test beds for Jaguar. The T and N contract was perfect as it required just a few very important flywheel calculations and one 20 ton heavy test rig which was all custom designed and GEC could cope with nicely. Delivery was 30 weeks. The T&N project was a remarkable success with the test rig being fought over by two big companies only last year, 2016. Buoyed on by this success we went for the Jaguar testbed business. We, Microface quoted GEC £2 million for the 24 computer systems to GEC who went in at £24 million for the test cells to Jaguar. We were in the same position as all the other suppliers as these test cells were so advanced that no one had the product ready for supply. In fact, the closest design was a single test cell that Microface had automated just down the road at Austin Rover. So, in fact GEC were in a better position than the others and the delivery time of two years was also perfect. Our presentation went well but after a few days we were chosen as the best supplier but Siemens were a close second at £18 million. GEC were told that if they could get close to the Siemens price the order was theirs. At a meeting, I attended at GEC to see what to do. It was obvious that GEC had included £10 million of costs which could be defined as market entry fees or development. I pointed out that this order would place us at the forefront of the test cell business which in the UK alone was more than 100 times bigger than this contract that GEC should fund the reduced price as a cost of market penetration. They pointed out that they would need Weinstock's personal permission to do this and they duly organised a meeting. I did not attend this meeting but rushed round after it to see what had happened. They were told by Weinstock that they could have as much money as they wanted provided it was all paid back in 11 months. This is where I found out this magic number which dominated Weinstock's thinking. In other words, to fit the GC formula we had not only to complete the Jaguar order in half the time required but we also had to secure another 48 test bed orders and complete them within the time to fit Weinstock's formula. We knew this was impossible so we let the order go. This was my last involvement with GEC as I realized I was wasting my time. The wind farm business fared no better. They accepted their first order for a wind farm without first trying things out. They were shocked to find that wind farms are not just a matter of installing several wind turbines. They all interact with each other and one will stop for a while and give all its wind to another, and a few minutes later the situation is reversed. The solution to this? is easy but they panicked and got themselves a very bad name. Today the most profitable wind farm business in the world is the one which provides the software to do this. About this time, I found out that Mike Pinches, 
My old colleague at Marconi had been poached by Rackle by being offered larger development budgets. Mike was featured recently acting as himself in a documentary about the rise of Vodafone from Rackle, a business that GEC could easily have had if they had kept the staff and invested in development that GEC had exhibited in 1971. They would also probably have had a clout to get the government to relinquish the GPO monopoly on all calls which stifled the mobile phone business for another 10 years until Margaret Thatcher allowed Rackle access to this market in the early 80s. About 1990 I automated a test rig for Tsmati and met the chief engineer Nick Hughes. It seems I had met Nick some years ago in 1981 at Avery Scales. I considered Avery a pioneering company who was redesigning its own mechanical scales to use electronics and wanted our programming language to make a really top-end scale with programmable features. I had often wondered why this business had dried up for Microface but found out from Nick that GEC Influence who had just bought the company in 1979 took hold after my visit and all development had to be sales funded which meant you could not think further ahead than about six weeks, the longest time anyone would wait for a pair of scales. Nick had jumped ship soon after my visit. So, with the unshakable 11-month rule firmly in place the Marconi company continued for years building up the cash mountain and making smaller profits which in later wine stock years was bolstered by property sales of which there were a lot including the Art Nouveau Chelmsford Marconi, New Street, Factory. When Simpson took over the cash mountain was in place but the technology was not. The result was inevitable after the hopeless wine stock years that produced only some very good engineers who moved to better run companies. To achieve a successful high tech company requires very clear goals, very enthusiastic staff and finance as required. Any one of these missing spells failure. For example, Pilkington's learnt from the invention of float glass that spending on R&D was good. So they built a massive R&D in my home village of Newburgh and filled it with academics and engineers with no goals. This was also fatal and the R&D centre bankrupted the company without producing any viable improvements. One can see the same effect in the automotive industry with Tesla who have all three, while Ford and the others have two but no motivated staff. It requires all three to get it right. So when Simpson joined GEC to take over from Weinstock, the company was already a basket case due to total mismanagement by Weinstock. It was no wonder that Weinstock gave Simpson his head as he must have known by then, after having to sell the company silver to make things look good, that there was little future. The big mistake was on the part of the banks who backed Weinstock at every juncture. If he had had more trouble with them it's possible his mismanagement could have been spotted. Certainly I and all my friends know what would happen apart from the yes man Barry Scott who thought the sun shone out of Weinstock's every orifice. It is no wonder Weinstock promoted him so quickly. Quote from Wikipedia and bold italics. On the 18th of March 1996 Simpson was confirmed as managing director of GEC as replacement to Lord Weinstock. In reporting the appointment the Independent said, some analysts believe that Mr Simpson's inside knowledge of BAE a long-rumoured GEC bid target, was a key to his appointment. GEC favours forging a national champion defence group with beta compete with the giant US organisations. In 1999 he sold GEC's defence business, Marconi Electronic Systems, to BAE for £7.7 .7 billion and repositioned the company as a major player in the telecommunications industry as Marconi PLC. I have no idea where the cash mountain went or the £7.7 .7 billion because a few years later another quote from Wikipedia. Marconi borrowed heavily to finance expansion into this market and was especially vulnerable to the burst of the dot-com bubble. After a botched profits warning in July 2001 Simpson's deputy chief executive, John Mayo, resigned. A second profits warning in September 2001 saw Simpson and chairman Sir Roger Hearn resign. The effect of this collapse was felt long after Simpson's resignation. Despite a major restructuring the company continued to struggle until 2005 when the loss of a major BT contract forced the company to seek a buyer. Marconi was purchased by Ericsson in 2005, several businesses not acquired by Ericsson formed Talent PLC. Talnet is now turning over less than 500 million per annum and hardly worth a year's turnover.
On the other hand Simmons who was smaller to GEC when we were computing for Jaguar quoted by Wikipedia and Wind Farms. Siemens and its subsidiaries employ approximately 385,000 people worldwide and reported global revenue of around 87 billion euros in 2019 according to its earnings release. Example of asset stripping. There was a factory located at Bittle Road in Chelmsford, which was originally part of Crompton and Company. The site was taken over by Marconi Radar Systems Limited in the late 1960s. They remained the occupiers for over 20 years until it was sold for housing development. Only the head office building fronting Rittle Road remains, the old Crompton name is still visible over the door. And the fate of the first purpose-built radio factory in the world. Following the occupation, Chelmsford Council successfully grey two listed four buildings on the site, 1912 New Street Building, New Street Cottages, the Powerhouse, the Water Tower. The Art Deco Factory, Marconi House and Building 720 are not listed. Bought by Ashwell Property Group, the company fell into administration in 2008 9th, with redevelopment due to start in 2010. The site was finally sold for redevelopment to Bellwee Homes in the summer of 2012 with demolition of the majority of the site including the iconic Marconi House and Building 720 in April-May 2013. Only the Grey 2 listed water tower, the 1912 front building facade, the new streets cottages and the powerhouse will remain. On the 6th of June 2008, Chelmsford Amateur Radio Society, CARS, set up an amateur radio station to commemorate the 96 years of production at the site, broadcasting under special call sign GB96 MWT. On the 23rd of June 2012, Cars set up another amateur radio station to commemorate 100 years of the site opening. I took a nostalgic journey to Marconi's in Chelmsford in 2010 by arranging to take my amateur radio society exams in Essex. There was nothing left apart from the sailing club I used to enjoy on the Blackwater which I was glad to see that had been acquired by the club members from the defunct company. Yes it had its own sailing club for Impl. Oils with any tide accessible moorings where I used to sail a fin which was popular on the black water. Copyright July 2017 Ted Slevin Microface Limited. The End